In this video, I'll describe how to apply limits to compute instantaneous rates of change. Here is a square. If x is the area of the square, what is the rate of change of the side length with respect to the square's area when the area is 5 square centimeters? Initially, it seems like we don't need to use a variable because we already know the area of the square. But if we're interested in thinking about the rate of change, then we need to imagine that the square is growing, so that the side length and area are both getting larger. And, right when the area is 5, we want to know the rate of change of side length. So, for our original square, we will let f of x represent the square's side length. Then, f of x is equal to the square root of x, since the square root of x times the square root of x is x, the square's area. So, essentially, our task is to determine the instantaneous rate of change of f of x with respect to x when x equals 5. The first step in doing this is to represent the average rate of change of the square's side length with respect to its area. Right now, the area of the square is 5 square centimeters, so the length of each side is the square root of 5 centimeters, which we can write as f of 5. Now, imagine the square's area increasing by delta x square centimeters, then the length of the side of this larger blue square would be f of 5 plus delta x centimeters. So, the average rate of change of the square's side length with respect to its area is given by the change in the square's side length, so f of 5 plus delta x minus f of 5 divided by the corresponding change in the square's area. To get the instantaneous rate of change of the square's side length with respect to its area when the area is 5 square centimeters, we'll use the limiting value of this average rate of change as the change in the square's area approaches zero. Since we know a formula for the function f, we can replace f of 5 plus delta x with the square root and f of 5 with its square root. Now, let's try to evaluate this limit to determine a numerical value for the instantaneous rate of change. Your first instinct might be to copy this expression and then break apart the square root of the sum of 5 and delta x. But this is not a valid algebraic operation, so we need to try something else. Another attempt might be to copy the expression and then try plugging in 0 for delta x. In the first square root, this just leaves you with 5, and then the numerator just becomes 0. And the denominator is also 0, so this leaves us with an indeterminate form and can't be evaluated. So we need a different technique for evaluating this limit. The challenge with evaluating this limit is dealing with the square root expression. After we copy the expression, a strategy for accomplishing this is to multiply the numerator and denominator of this expression by something called the conjugate of the numerator. In this case, the conjugate of the numerator is the square root of 5 plus delta x plus the square root of 5. What makes it the conjugate is that we're adding root 5 instead of subtracting it. Of course, if we just multiply the numerator by the conjugate, then we're changing the fraction, but if we also multiply the denominator by the conjugate, then we're really multiplying by something that's equivalent to 1 so it won't change the fraction. Let's give ourselves some room to actually multiply these fractions. When we multiply the first terms in the numerators, we're multiplying a square root by itself, so this will be equivalent to just 5 plus delta x. When we multiply the first term in the first fraction with the second term in the second fraction, we're multiplying root 5 times root 5 plus delta x. There isn't a way to simplify this, so we'll just add it below. When we multiply the second term in the first fraction with the first term in the second fraction, we've got the same thing as before, except this time we're subtracting the term. When we multiply the second terms, we have negative root 5 times root 5, which is equal to negative 5. We'll include this below. Finally, we multiply the denominators. We can't simplify this, so we'll just write it in the denominator below. Now, let's see if there are some terms that cancel. Positive 5 and negative 5 add to 0, so they'll cancel, and we can remove them from the fraction. Also, the two middle terms in the numerator are additive inverses of each other, so they add to 0 and cancel, and we can remove them from the fraction. Now, both the numerator and denominator of the fraction have a delta x term, 
which we can factor out. This leaves us with a 1 in the numerator. This new fraction is equivalent to 1, so we can remove it from the product. Let's make this a little more compact. In this limit, delta x is getting closer to 0. So the limiting value of this expression, as delta x approaches 0, is 1 divided by the square root of 5 plus the square root of 5, or, simply, 1 over 2 root 5. To summarize what we just did, we started with a square whose side lengths were growing. We were trying to compute the rate of change of the square's side length with respect to its area, when the area is 5 square centimeters. We used the function f to denote the relationship between the square's area and side length. So, we were trying to compute the derivative of f when x was equal to 5 centimeters. We used the definition of a derivative to write this as a limit, and then did some algebraic computation to evaluate this limit as equal to 1 over 2 root 5. So, the value of the instantaneous rate of change is 1 over 2 root 5 centimeters per square centimeter. And this is an example of a more general process. To use the limit definition to compute values of derivatives, you start with a function. In our example, it was the square root of x, but it could be anything. Then, if you want to compute the value of the derivative of f at x equals a, you write the average rate of change as x increases by an amount of delta x, and then look at the limiting value as delta x approaches zero. You plug a plus delta x and a into the formula. Next, you do some algebra and try to isolate the delta x, and finally compute the limiting value as delta x approaches zero.